So haps everybody, Joe here, and today I'm gonna go over some of the orchestration work that went on behind the scenes in Stella from our last album, You Won't Believe What Happens Next. So I'm gonna go over some orchestration techniques, uh, some mixing techniques for your modern orchestra as well, and just sort of the approach we took behind this orchestral sound and how it would fit behind a progressive metal music. So let's get into it. The way this started was uh, Joey had sent me uh, a MIDI track of basically like each instrument group. So up here, I got like a woodwind MIDI track and he just sort of played it all on the keyboard and sent it over. Uh, horn MIDI as well. And then, nope, that splits it. <laughs> and then string MIDI, just all sort of played in at one time. Uh, that keeps things pretty easy. So what I did is I took some of this stuff and I made sure I went in, and gave it some like, it's a little quantizing and stuff, but also just made sure all the voices worked well nicely. Uh, like for horns, for example, I'd go in and I'd try to make sure that we're not uh, in big moments walking into some like parallel fifths or octaves, but instead we're like, there's actually some contrary motion in there, making things sound bigger. And I would uh, just mess around with some doubling and stuff too. Like a lot of times I might take the flutes staccato and the violin staccato, and they're sort of doubling the same line. So that gave me just more flexibility to add more stuff in. I eventually also added like percussion. So there's glockenspiel and stuff like that, choir. So lots of fun stuff. But let's go to the beginning here. The first time the orchestra comes in on this song is during the first of that 7-8 theme. Like, starts on the big A. Uh, I'll play just the backing track. Right over here. So you hear behind that, we have orchestra. So let's get a little into that. Uh, it's This starts off pretty light. And what I'll say about this section compared to maybe the end section is that, let me see if I can zoom out a little more. You see what you got going on for this first section. And then obviously the bigger section, it just, it really fills out. And I didn't want the first, uh, iteration of this to sound too big because we have a climax that we're hitting later on in the song. So one thing that you'll notice here is that my trumpet, uh, like a high violin one part, soprano, choir, and piccolo are all gone from this first section. I just sort of made it so that the contrast over here was bigger. You had more highs, you had more lows, and everything in the middle It's just sort of more spread out towards the end, whereas the beginning is not as much. So yeah, getting to the woodwinds here. Uh, a lot of times woodwinds can sound pretty whimsical, uh, pretty frilly, especially for like metal music. You don't think that it would be your best friend there, but I like how it supports strings a lot. So we added just some of that in there and it adds a little lightheartedness. Like we're not, I don't want to say this section is like too serious, you know, but we're building up. So I'll play that section just for you here. And these big notes at the bottom are all key switches, just triggering different articulations. But you got the music up here. And what we have is flutes up here, oboes over here, then a bassoon, and maybe even clarinet, just doing a little pad behind them. That is more or less doubled by these string patches. I just use ensemble patches here just because I didn't want to get too into it. The strings are almost like they're doing a staccato line, but it's more of a pad also. Like they, you don't get as much of the actual line the woodwinds are doing, but it supports it in a cool way. And I'll play that with that going on. Hits the line there, you know. 
Cascades up. So that's what you got going on there. Now the brass is like a totally different world. If I go into the brass, it's, uh, you know, that's that section sounds pretty lighthearted there, but if I just solo the brass here, it's like, it's almost terrifying. It's like really scary. It sounds like Lord of the Rings or something. And what makes the magic here and makes this brass sound really good is uh, making sure that the inner voices are doing something interesting, that your top and bottom lines are moving contrary to each other. You don't want to just move them both up into like a fifth or a fourth or an octave. I know it's an old Bach rule, but he was, uh, he was right on that one. Like it doesn't sound good. And if you are going to move in the same direction, as the melodic line, you want to at least make sure it's like a third or a sixth of some kind of interval. So those spread out voicings and that contrary motion really help to make it feel like the brass is growing there. Uh, with brass, I really like to double that with choir as well. And the secret here is I'm not even using a great choir library. Like I'm just using contact factory choir. So Definitely not an amazing choir library, if I can play some of it. It's not incredible, you know, but uh, I really made sure I caked it in reverb. If you go over here, it's just sending to a lot of reverb. That helps it sound a little better. But what brass does really well is it supports sorry, what choir really does really well is it supports the brass. So if I play those, like if I just play the choir separately, it's maybe not as cool. That doesn't sound that great, right? If you heard that solo, you'd be like, man, Atreco sounds like hacks. This is not good at all. But uh, if I play that with the brass... Without choir, with choir. Where that really makes a difference is in like this, uh, this section over here. It just sounds massive. It's like sounds like from like the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess soundtrack or something. It's got that big sweeping feel. Without the choir. Not as fun, right? So it adds that little something to it, which is really cool. So that's that whole first section, and I'll just I'll play that together here, I guess. And show you what's going on. So when you combine that really scary sounding brass with the more whimsical woodwinds and the lighter hearted string line, they sort of meet in the middle for like a progressive metal attitude, I guess. So, you hear this, this sounds big, but what if it wasn't? I'll do this without reverb. With. Without. Really dry, right? It sounds like you're just in the scoring stage there for the brass. Like, there's not much going on. 
I'll fade it back in. And now it actually sounds like the strings are somewhere and that they're doing like a concert or something like that. So the reverb I'm using here is Valhalla Room. Valhalla Room is the best reverb. Don't at me. I've tried a bunch of reverbs and I've never been happier with one than Valhalla Room. I've been using this for years and I can always, you can open up Valhalla Room to the default setting and honestly, half the time, that's what I use because it sounds so good. So here I have the Church of San Lorenzo preset. I think I modded it just a little bit. Uh, got a pretty generous decay time at almost three seconds. And then a pre-delay of 14 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds. Uh, what your pre-delay is going to simulate here is going to be the distance between you and the orchestra. Uh, sometimes... If I'm going for like a real filmy atmosphere, I might even like go up to 20 something milliseconds, especially for brass or something. If I'm doing reverb separately, I might give brass more pre-delay than strings, for example, just to simulate them being farther back. But for simplicity in this session, I just uh, simulated that effect by having either more or less reverb on the send. So... When you're adding reverb to your instruments, you might be wondering how much to add. You wanna think of where everything is laid out in an orchestra. So towards the back is gonna be your percussionist, right? They're all the way in the back. Uh, maybe in front of them, you have your brass section uh, followed by strings around them and then woodwinds toward the front. So anything that's closer to you is not going to need as much reverb as something that's farther away because that source is closer to your ears. You're not going to get as many reflections hitting different places and coming back to you as much as you're going to get the direct source from violin one to your face. So you can sort of uh, scale your reverbs in that order. I really won't give much to woodwinds. Uh, give a little bit to strings. Sometimes you can give some of the lower strings a little more just because they might be farther back, but also that can make things a little muddier. So that's up to you there. Brass is where you can really sort of cake on the reverb, and I find that helps a lot. If I play just the brass here without reverb, with reverb. If I go over to here, you're going to see just how much reverb I'm adding. Uh, tuba, since it's further back, gonna give that more reverb. Trombone, trumpet a little less. French horns are usually like, I feel like in like the same place as trombones and trumpet, but for whatever reason, I really do enjoy the sound of caking on reverb to French horns. So I'll usually just give that a little more just for taste. And then you can look at like the French horn reverb it's at 1.9 versus the violin one, which is at minus 4.6. So definitely giving a lot more to the brass than the strings there. And that helps simulate that area of space that some instruments are closer to you, some instruments are farther away. Additionally, on the reverb send, I also have just a slight bit of filtering going on. So if I go here, I've got like a high pass at 300 and then we're cutting around 10K as well. The little bit of a scoop out of the yucky yucks over here. Didn't need much of that. And uh, just another EQ, just doing another slight move, a little more low end getting out of there. A lot of times I also like to level off my reverb with a little compression but I bypassed this, so for whatever reason, I guess I didn't think I needed it. But just like, it'll be like really light, just barely making the needle move, just the theme at a tiny bit. Yeah, I don't know why it's bypassed here. I kind of like it with the sound now. <laughs> so, yeah, let's check out this section. I'll fade the, uh, the backing track back in.
So that's the first section there. Uh, let's check out this bigger section back here. It's a lot of the same approach. Uh, this, uh, when the solo section kicks back in in the 7-4 part, you get what I call the quacky quacks. So what makes it sound so quacky is the oboe. Oboe's just got a quacky tone to it. But uh, if you just check out the woodwinds, it's a really lighthearted atmosphere almost. Higher octave comes in on the flute there, as well as in the strings. Now we got this more sweeping legato feel to it. And that's just woodwinds there. If I play the woodwinds and strings together, you get a pretty similar part. where the low strings are doubling the bassoon and the higher strings are doubling the flute and oboe. Second half kicks up an octave, makes it sound a little bigger. And then we have this legato and the flutes chugging along in the strings, really building up intensity. As that comes in, the brass has some pads going and the choir is falling along with the brass. It sounds massive. There's a little percussion as well. Glockenspiel hits the melody. Big percussion hit. And you get this massive sound here. So it's pretty fun. So yeah, a lot of the doubling that I like to do is uh, usually if you have two instruments that are in the same range, you can double them pretty well. So flutes and violins make a great pair. Flutes and trumpets would be cool. Uh, lower strings like cello pairs well with French horn. Those two can also pair well with clarinet. I usually like to pick one or the other. You can pair like brass and woodwind, brass and string, or woodwind and string, but usually not like three at a time unless I'm feeling really frisky. Bassoons are great for following your trombones and tubas, uh, as well as your cellos would be too, or your bass. And then percussion, it's usually just doing its own hits, but glockenspiel, I'll usually have follow the top line. I'll show you just that. It's a uh, It's just following the trumpet, I think. Just adding a little attack. But yeah, that's a, that's a trick I'll use a bit too. I do that in Iris as well. Just having the glockenspiel there, hitting that big melody just for a little extra attack and a little shininess. Uh, and again, I, I can't tell you how much I love pairing the brass and the choir together. Now, if your strings are legato, strings and choir also makes a great doubling. You can literally just give that choir whatever the strings are doing, whatever the brass are doing. Basically, whoever has the pads, give that to the choir and you'll be happy. But right at this section, I just love this sound. It's just that human element, you know, like even with a crappy choir library that comes with contact, you can really get away with some cool stuff. So everyone, that about wraps it up for uh, a little lesson on orchestration techniques, doubling, stuff like that. Uh, I hope you like this video. If you like videos like this, you want to see more in the future, please let me know. And uh, 
yeah, I'll play us out. Thanks for watching. Thank you.